Hello again, my name is Kelly Dickens. I'm one of the elders here at Walden Community Church. I hope this message finds you all well. I apologize for not recording the video like we did last week. I had some logistical issues, so I had to fall back to the old way. The good news is you won't have to suffer through this again because next week, the plan is to meet in person for those that want to and are able. Since we aren't having the donuts and coffee visitation, we'll start class right after 9.30 services are finished and everyone makes their way over to the Family Life Center, probably 10.45 or so. We're going to use as much of the kitchen areas we need to in order to social distance, so we should be able to really spread out. Masks are not required, but they're certainly encouraged. I'll certainly be wearing one until I start the lesson and even during the lesson if you guys can still hear me. We're going to try and record the session for those of you that can't show up in person. It's going to mean some changes in the way we do things. For example, the microphone won't pick up the people in the audience, so I'll be reading all of the scriptures. If someone asks a question, we'll do our best to repeat the question and any comments. It seems like so long since we were together. I look forward to seeing some of you again next week. Let's get started. Here's a list of the verses in case you want to pause the video and bookmark these passages. As a reminder, I'll be reading from the ESV translation today. Today's lesson talks about sacrifice. Unless you've had your te television off for the last two months, you've watched numerous stories about first responders and what some of them have sacrificed to respond to the COVID crisis. Scores of them have given up time with their families. Some have given up their health as they contracted the virus. And unfortunately, some have given their all as they succumbed to the coronavirus and passed away. There's been horrible tragedy for literally millions of people around the world because of COVID. But there have also been tremendous heroes that have sacrificed a lot. Sacrifice, what does that really mean? The dictionary defines sacrifice in many ways depending on the context. For today's lesson, the most fitting description is an act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. While this crisis has given us ample examples throughout history, there have always been people that are willing to sacrifice. The Second World War gave us many more examples. We're told Pilecki was a Polish cavalry officer during the early days of World War II. For those of you that don't remember history, the invasion of Poland by Nazi Germany really plunged the world into war. Pilecki served as a cavalry officer fighting against the Soviets after they invaded from the east. Germany and Russia had agreed to divide Poland up. Once Poland fell, which really only took a few weeks, Pilecki co-founded the secret Polish army resistance group and was later a member of the Home Army. The Poles had gotten wind of atrocities being committed at the Auschwitz concentration camp, but they couldn't get any details. Pilecki was a Catholic and a Polish patriot who viewed his struggle as a moral and patriotic duty. So in order to gather more information, Pilecki volunteered for a resistance operation that involved him being captured and imprisoned at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Can you imagine being free and then volunteering to be captured and sent to Auschwitz, a concentration camp where you knew atrocities were being committed and people were being killed by the thousands? Once in the camp, he organized a resistance movement within the camp, which eventually numbered in the hundreds, and secretly sent messages to the Western allies that detailed the Nazi atrocities at the camp. He eventually escaped the camp in April 1943 after two and a half years in that prison. Unfortunately, the story doesn't have a happy ending as he remained loyal to the Polish government in exile in London after the takeover by the communists. In 1947, he was arrested by the secret police on charges of working for foreign imperialism and was executed after a show trial. People like Pilecki are celebrated as heroes because they willingly sacrificed for a greater cause. I don't know about you, but when I think of sacrifices I make, it doesn't come close to measuring up to any of the examples we've talked about. And this is probably a good time to reiterate something I've said in the past. 
no one is more surprised than I am that I'm leading this Bible study. I find it really difficult to stand up in front of you and exhort you about these lessons because I need the lessons as much or more than you do. My idea of sacrifice might be not having a second Rice Krispie treat after dinner. We're closing in on the last few lessons in our study of the Epistle of the Romans. In the lesson today, Paul tells the Roman believers that Christians are also lived, called to live as sacrifices. In the preceding chapter, Paul spent a great deal of time addressing simmering jealousies between the Jews and the Gentiles. In the final section of his letter, Paul addressed ways God's mercy and grace should be expressed in the life of the body. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 1 and 2 are among the best-known verses in the New Testament, and rightfully so. Paul begins the verse by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. The King James Version says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. It's important to note two things from this statement. First, the Greek word translated appeal can mean to comfort or encourage, but here it means to strongly urge or to make a strong request. Paul is exhorting the Christians at Rome toward what he's about to say. It's not Moses standing on the mountain yelling, thou shalt not. He is imploring them, appealing to them, pleading with them. Second, he uses the word brothers or brethren or brothers and sisters, depending on the translation. Toward the end of chapter 11, Paul began to specifically address the Gentiles. As he transitioned to the last section of this letter, he once again addresses the entire church of Rome, Jews and Gentiles alike. To add gravitas to what he's saying, Paul then tells them why they should do this. He says, quote, by the mercies of God or, quote, in view of God's mercy. Paul often based his commands on his apostolic authority. However, this request is based on the mercies of God. In the opening chapters, Paul proved that all, both Jew and Gentile, were by nature under sin. They had no claim to righteousness under the law. Only because of God's compassion in giving his son to die for our sins did we have a chance at salvation. That's why they should listen to what he's about to say and commit themselves to it, because God has shown us great mercy. What does Paul say that they should do? Paul says that they should, quote, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. One of the commentaries I read, the Sermon Bible, said that, quote, this brief text has a remarkable way to putting what I call the sum of Christian service. The main leading idea is the gathering together of all Christian duty into this one mighty word, sacrifice. Paul used language that refers back to the Jewish sacrificial system, which, if you'll remember, was still active in Jerusalem when Paul wrote his letter. It was something that everyone could relate to, even the Gentiles who might have sacrificed to idols in the past. Paul says that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Instead of a physical sacrifice, Paul uses the sacrificial language figuratively. We are to be living sacrifices since the Old Testament sacrificial law ended with Jesus dying on the cross for us. The Jewish dispensation with its sacrifices was ended. It ended when Christ, our Passover sacrifice, was offered in order to save us. First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. The old sacrificial system has been replaced with a new order of sacrifice. We are to give ourselves. As the victim on the altar was surrendered wholly to God, so our bodies with all its members should be consecrated to his service not as something slain on the altar, but as living sacrifices. We do this when our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit and are used to serve God. 
Paul urged the believers to offer not some specific service to God, but their whole beings. And the Old Testament was only part of the animal sacrificed? No, the whole animal was used, and after it was sacrificed, it couldn't even been eaten. It was burnt up. The whole animal was a sacrifice to God. It was dedicated to him. Just like those sacrifices, we're to give our whole selves to God. Paul used three words to qualify the type of sacrifices we are to offer. Living, holy, and acceptable. The sacrifice Paul urged was not one that died as it was given, but one that kept being offered as long as the person offering it was alive. To be holy meant to be separated from the world and consecrated to God. Such a sacrifice would be pleasing to God. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In verse 2, Paul used a negative command followed by a positive command to explain how the believer was to offer a holy, pleasing sacrifice to God. First, to use the negative command, Paul admonished the Roman church against being conformed to this world. What does it mean to be conformed to the world? Paul used the same Greek word that's translated world when he reminded the Galatian Christians that Jesus had rescued them, quote, from the present evil age. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4 says, He who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Ever since the world began, the world's been dominated by sin and death. Paul warned believers to not allow the evil of this present age to push them into its mold. Such conformity to the evils of the world is the opposite of the sacrifice Paul urges to make. Rather than being influenced by this age, believers are to be, quote, transformed by the renewal of your mind. The process of renewal is accomplished in the life of believers by the power of the Holy Spirit. The result of this transformation is the opposite of a, quote, debased mind to which God had delivered over those who refused to acknowledge him as God. Their mind was such that they were unable to do what was right. Believers, on the other hand, are to adjust their way of thinking in accordance with the renewing power of the Holy Spirit. This is an ongoing process. Through this renewal, believers will be able to discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Greek word translated discern means to draw conclusions about the worth of something on the basis of testing. This mind-renewing work of the Spirit enables the Christian to understand what God would have done in a particular situation and to act accordingly. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives changes the way that we view the world and what we deem valuable. Verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. After dealing with the use of spiritual gifts within the church, in verses 3 through 8, Paul turned his attention to the topic of love. In the book of Mark, Jesus ranked love of God and love of neighbor as the most important commandments. In chapter 12, Jesus is being tested by the Pharisees and Sadducees, and one of the scribes comes to him and asks, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answers, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is, is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The love that Paul speaks of in verse 9 is agape love. In Strong's Concordance, there's probably a half page of meanings for agape. The ones that seem most fitting were, quote, the highest form of love, charity, and, quote, the love of God for man and of man for God. The love that the believers had for one another was the sign by which the world would know that they were Jesus' disciples. John chapter 13, verse 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Paul assumed that Christians would love God, sorry, would love since God's love had been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The believers in Rome were urged to make sure this love was genuine. 
We need to make sure that our love is more than a pretense or outward actions that do not reflect the nature of God. Paul followed up with two more exhortations. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. The Greek word translated abhor was used to express an exceptionally harsh emotion. It's not like a mild dislike when you have to take medicine you don't like or take out the trash. It means to detest, to dislike something so much that you shudder. Believers are to strongly reject anything that God's word says is eagle, evil. The good to which believers are to cling probably echoes what Paul wrote in verse 2, quote, the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In the following verses, Paul unpacked what genuine love looks like. The list of 10 qualities Paul gave here parallels his list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. The list is terse, giving the topic followed by the proper response. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. The first example relates specifically to love. The Greek word translated love here is different than the word in verse 9. This is Philadelphia, or brotherly love, brotherly kindness, or love of brethren. With respect to brotherly love, believers are to be warmly devoted to each other. Genuine love will be obvious by the devotion and affection believers have for one another. Growing out of a genuine affection for one another, believers are called to outdo one another in showing honor. Rather than seek recognition or favored position, genuine love will believe will lead believers to work diligently at praising the achievements of others. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. The two commands in this verse are related to each other. The Greek word translated zeal was used to describe eagerness in discharging a duty or responsibility. The Greek word translated do not be slothful was used by Jesus in his parables of the talents to describe an evil, evil lazy servant in Matthew chapter 25. Paul didn't specify the object of their zeal, though we should probably understand it to either be our true worship from Romans 12 verse 1 or the genuine love that believers are to pursue from Romans 12 verse 9. Paul gave similar instructions to the Galatians. Chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The second command continues the idea of zeal, be fervent in spirit. The Greek word translated ferment literally means to boil or seethe. The same phrase was used in Acts to describe Apollos. The phrase could refer to a spiritual fervor or it could refer to being fervent in the Holy Spirit. Assuming that Paul was referring to the Holy Spirit, then we could paraphrase his command and say, be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. The final command in this verse may be seen as a correction to an unbridled enthusiasm for the Spirit that leads to the kind of grandstanding that apparently was going on in the church at Corinth. The fervor that Paul sought was to be expressed in service to God. Verse 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. The three exhortations in this verse flow logically from first to last. As believers, we are called on to rejoice in hope. Early in the letter, in chapter 5, verse 2, Paul had urged believers to rejoice with him, saying, quote, We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Believers are able to rejoice because the hope of our salvation and our glorious inheritance. But Paul wanted to make sure that the Roman Christians understood that this path to God's glory would not be without suffering. Paul saw suffering as a precious privilege granted to believers. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, Paul says, <clears throat> For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. In the context of this tribulation, Paul says that believers must endure. Our ability to patiently endure suffering is contingent on the degree to which we persevere in prayer. Even a cursory reading of Paul's letters reveals the degree to which 
he was dependent on prayer. We can rejoice in our hope, in the, even in the midst of tribulation, if we are faithful in prayer. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The Greek word translated contribute was sometimes translated fellowship. The word could also describe as here participation in meeting the needs of others. Paul charged the believers in Ephesus to work hard in order to have something to share with those in need. John questioned how the love of God could abide in someone who refused to help provide for the needs of a fellow believer. Paul's last exhortation was to show hospitality. Hospitality was the process by which a stranger became a guest. Hospitality to strangers has long been a tradition in both Jewish and Arab cultures and continues today. It was especially important in Paul's time because of the lack of safe, clean, and expensive places where a traveler could eat and sleep. The church depended on hospitality to carry out its commission to send out evangelists and missionaries. The writer of Hebrew, Hebrew suggested that Christians who practice hospitality might actually have entertained angels. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Believers weren't just to respond to opportunities that came their way. They were to go out of their way to minister to travelers. We have been changed by Jesus' work on the cross, and we are being transformed by the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. Our new life in Christ changes the way we look at the world, including how we allocate the resources that God has placed in our care. Verses 14 and 15, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Paul turned his attention from a proper perspective on life within the body to the proper way to relate to outsiders. Paul admonished, admonished, admonished believers, quote, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. To bless someone is to call down God's gracious action in that person's life. To curse someone is to call on God to punish that person, especially by bringing disaster upon them. During the time when we think Paul wrote this letter, there isn't really a record of widespread state-sponsored persecution against the Christians in Rome. So Paul must have been addressing the exclusion and pressure that was, and sometimes is today, often a part of daily life for the Christian. On his missionary journeys, Paul often encountered persecution. Paul's advice here echoes the words of Jesus. In Matthew 5, verse 44, Jesus said, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Paul finishes verse 15 by saying, quote, Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. If we as believers are to be sensitive to the joys and sorrows of our fellow believers, it will foster a closeness that not only speaks well to those follow, fellow believers, but outsiders that are watching the church. Any jealousy that would keep us from rejoicing in the good fortune of fellow believers or callousness towards someone in pain or inattention to the hurt in the life of a brother or sister in faith has no place in God's church. Paul made a similar point when addressing the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26 says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Chapter uh, 12, verses 12, 16 through 18. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul called for believers to share their joys and sorrow. But that could only happen if they shared a common mindset. In his charge to live in harmony with another, Paul used the same Greek word he used with the Philippian believers to think the same way. Philippians chapter 2 verse 2 says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. We don't have to agree on every point, 
But we need to approach each issue with a renewed mind, sensitive to the needs of others. The biggest obstacle to this type of mindset is pride. Don't be haughty. The phrase could be translated, don't be social climbers. Instead, per, Paul urged believers to associate with the lowly. The word that is translated associate could mean to accommodate to a situation or circumstance. In that case, Paul replaced the responsibility of the believer who had financial means to adjust to the person in the lowly position. Paul's antidote for pride was association with the needy, the outcast, and the less fortunate. Such an attitude will keep us from thinking more of ourselves than we ought. In verse 17, Paul again turned an eye toward the believer's attitude toward outsiders. The call to forego retaliation can be found in several places in the New Testament. Paul gave similar instruction to the Christians in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. These teachings echo Jesus' instruction on the Sermon on the Mount. Rather than insisting on an eye for an eye, believers were told not to resist someone doing evil to them. Paul says, give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, which is the counterpoint of refusing to retaliate. The command in verse 18 is tied to the prohibition against retaliation in verse 17. Paul acknowledged that hostility is an inevitable part of living the Christian life, and that much of the hostility will be on the control of the believer. However, Paul warned believers not to use that tension as an excuse to create more tension. Believers are to do everything within their power to live peaceably with all. Christians should be ready to work with all men of goodwill in any cause, always being careful to act in the spirit of love without compromising their loyalty to Christ and his truth. Little problem with the slides there. This week's lesson began with the admi admonition to present our whole selves to God in sacrificial services, allowing our minds to be renewed through the Holy Spirit that will help us determine for us the will of God. As we pursue God's will, life in the community of believers will be affected by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Paul used the illustration of the physical body whose various parts function together. Believers have been given various gifts, which when used together, cause the spiritual body to function properly. When the body is functioning properly, its members will be characterized by genuine love. Paul began and ended his section by urging believers to reject evil and cling to what is good. The way that we relate to those inside the church and out in the world will be affected by the salvation given to us through Jesus' completed work on the cross. Thanks for listening. As I said at the beginning of the lesson, next week we'll try to meet in person. We'll move on to lesson 12 as we close in on finishing out our study of Romans. The theme for that lesson is believers should seek to represent Christ well in their communities and world. The study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. I hope you have a great week, and I look forward to seeing some of you uh, next week. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for all that we have and help us remember that all that we have, you have given us. We pray for those that are affected, affected by coronavirus, whether physically, mentally, or financially. As we begin to try and bring things back to some semblance of normal, give us wisdom to do the right things and patience to go along with that. Be with our community. Keep us safe. Bring us back together soon. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.